I'm in a bit of a situation here because really I promised a talk with a fairly voluminous title, right? And I somehow suggested that uh, it is possible to wrap together uh, the exhibition of uh, Marc Chagall, uh, Hanukkah, uh, and uh, Hasidism for, for, for the good measure, right? And uh, it's not that it is impossible, but let's say it's... Uh, well, I, let, let's see what, what's going to happen, right? Let's see what's going to happen. And uh, it, it sort of makes me especially uh, kind of moving around more than usual because I know that Rabbi Klein is sitting just back there and I know that he's going to record every mistake, <laughs> like every date that I'm going to get wrong. I, I, I know he has a book. And, and later on, I will have to sort of face the consequences of suggesting such, again, voluminous kind of uh, titles. But on the other hand, it's, it's really the great thing about this place is that it allows that, right? Uh, because it is a fact that here right now, we do have under, around us uh, the 24 lithographs by Marc Chagall that are dedicated to the story of, of, uh, of Exodus. We do have uh, over 60 ritual objects in, um, uh, in the display cases on the, on the outer shell of that, of that space here that tell in different ways how Jewish people celebrated the uh, um, uh, Hanukkah over ages. Uh, and more than that, we also have an exhibit of Israeli art that is coming to us right now. Uh, art where people react immediately to the terrible events that shattered all of us on October 7th. So while all of that together, is, as it can very often happens with Jewish things, right? We are kind of almost crumbling under the weight of tragedy, right? And weight of history. But on the other hand, the images around us, as much as they acknowledge that, they also show us a way to deal with that. And not just to deal with that, but even to live with that. And that is something, right? So, um, so let us start with, let us start with Hanukkah, right? Let us start with Hanukkah and let's see how uh, how Hanukkah indeed, to some extent, can be linked to what happens on the walls around us with Mark Chagall. And then well, let's see how, how we do with other things. Okay, so the collection of our uh, Hanukkiot is really quite diverse. I do have to say that uh, we don't have very old Hanukkiot. It is important to mention generally, though, that it's not there are that many really old Hanukkiot in the world. So our most uh, um, oldest one uh, is from the end of the 18th century. That's not bad. But let's say there are older artifacts in other museums. But given our status of a small museum, right, it's very, very decent, right, to have an object from the uh, late 18th century. So um, Hanukkah, as you all know, right, is about the story of the light that just refused to go off, right? So the, uh, the story that is normally told about this holiday is the story of the revolt of uh, uh, Judah Maccabee uh, against the um, Greek uh, rule. And the story as we normally know it and how it is told in the Talmud is really about ways in which faith and adherence to faith uh, reveals itself as a kind of backbone of national identity, right? So let's, let's remember the story for, for, for a second. So Yudaha Maccabee or Judas the Maccabee defeats 
the Greeks, right, against all odds. He defeats the Greeks and he rededicates the temple. We are talking about the second temple, right? So the first temple is already gone. So we already have something behind us of that kind of dreadful history, right? So we're talking about the second temple. So he rededicates the temple. And basically the word, the Hebrew word Hanukkah, is about dedication, right? So he rededicates the temple, he cleanses the temple, and then when they are about to lit the menorah, right, they discover that there is not enough oil for it to go beyond one day, they still lit it, and a miracle happens, right? It keeps going on for more than one day, it keeps going on for a week, until they are able to perform all the necessary rituals and to prepare the next batch of the kosher oil, right? So the one portion was enough for eight days, and since then, this is how we commemorate it, right? We have eight lights for eight days, and the, the ninth light is our little helper, right? The Shamash. This is how the Talmud would like us to see that story. Interestingly enough, the book that actually tells the story, the book of Maccabees, right, does not mention any miracle at all, right? He tells the story of the revolt uh, and many different circumstances that surrounded the revolt, and then it becomes a very complicated story uh, where it's not always possible to tell the heroes and sort of the villains and the good guys are normally, right, when you really go into, into history, you, you start doubting those kind of clear-cut origin stories, right? So according to, to the book of Maccabees, there wasn't any miracle. At least they don't mention it, right? So Judah fought very hard. Because there was war, they could not uh, do the Sukkot celebrations properly, right? And during the Sukkot, uh, we, we don't just sit in the Sukkah, right? We eat in the Sukkah. So I might be sort of simplifying that situation a little bit, but it might be also fair to say that after this really difficult revolt, very difficult uh, uh, war, uh, the Maccabees also wanted to have this kind of moment to just, you know, sit, relax, have a good meal, which way they were deprived of, right, during, the, uh, during this hard time of hardship and war, have a proper meal, right, rest for a week, and celebrate the great victory, right? Which is a very understandable kind of emotion, right? And while uh, the Maccabees basically created the celebration of Hanukkah, rededication of the temple, but the book of Maccabees does not mention any miracles, okay? And it's very interesting that it is in the Talmud, right, later, uh, that this story of the miracle suddenly appears. So, why did it appear later on, right? And there, there could be different explanations, but let us remember that the Talmud is written after the destruction of the Second Temple, right? So, 17 after our, uh, 70 after our, uh, the beginning of our era, the Temple, the Second Temple is destroyed. There is no possibility for the Jewish people to conduct the rituals and the ceremonies as they are supposed to be in the temple. And basically this kind of the history of Judaism as we know it, in a sense, begins there, right? Because it is exactly that time that doesn't only furnish us with different stories. It is that time that furnishes us with the book of Torah, right? As the object that we know. And it furnishes us with the ritual of Torah reading as the major, as the central ritual of, uh, of, of Jewish liturgy as we know it now, right? Not the temple anymore, but the book, right? Not the many different objects and not the location, but the text is what keeps Jewish people Jewish, right? 
And to be Jewish, and this is really quite a formidable way to react to everything that happened in a sense, right? So to think that, well, we have no state any longer. We have no temple any longer. We have no king any longer. But we have the book, and that's enough. This is quite a formidable way of dealing with everything that happened, right? And it's formidable not just for the Jews. It's a really great universal idea to keep in mind. What keeps you who you are is not the place, and it is not the object. It's the ideas, right? It's the stories. They are enough. So the rabbis who wrote the Talmud over an extended period of time, right? They had that in mind. They wanted to keep the Jewish people from disappearing, right? And for that, they understood that stories are more important than objects. Stories are also, in a way, more important than rituals. Or rather, rituals and stories can always be changed and modified and basically geared toward that idea of preservation of an idea of a Jewish people. And the rabbis were really, really creative in that sense, and very innovative also. And probably in that context, it is not surprising that the story of the miracle appeared, right? Was it remembered? Was it invented? Who knows? Does it matter? Well, it kind of does, right? It kind of does, depending on what you want to learn and what you want to know. But it is unquestionably a very powerful story, right? And it is that story of the light that could not be uh, turned off, it could not be distinguished, right? That we keep with us. And um, it is the light, right? That, uh, that we keep thinking about when we, this very light, right? That we keep thinking about when we light the, uh, the candles. Um, at the same time, at the same time, while uh, there indeed was a great effort to, as much as possible, right, to stress the importance of text and story, right, <coughs> over object and materiality. And Judaism, in a way, since that time, uh, no, not only since that time, but since that time especially, carries that kind of certain suspicion, right, towards objects, towards materiality, towards, well, towards images especially, but that, that is a story that is way longer, right? The Second Commandment basically prohibits uh, uh, the Jews quite pointedly from worshiping anything that is uh, that comes to us in the form of an image right so that's a kind of longer story but here right the stress that the um, or the emphasis that the rabbis put on the text on the prayer right uh, it stands to, to certain kind of again maybe suspicion towards putting too much right putting too much of your weight spiritually, religiously, into something material, right? So the text, the study, the prayer, that's the real thing, okay? Um, and Jews who, whether they wanted or not, but were creative in that other realm, right? Who wanted to do stuff, right? We all want to do stuff, and we want stuff, right? We want objects. We want images, not just Jews, right? All of us. It's, it's something very, very basic that has to do with human experience, right? They often had a bit of a, you know, they were in a bit of a trouble, right? How you deal with that? How you deal with objects, materiality, and images in, uh, within a theology that generally is suspicious of things that have to do with all those wonderful realms, right? So, 
It is within that dichotomy that we can often view Jewish material culture, of which we have really wonderful examples all around us here. Okay? So, Hanukkah. There are two basic types, and I'm very proud to say that we have wonderful representative of both of those types in our collection. So the first type is that of the candelabra. And if you look just behind you on that showcase here, this is the type, right? So, and later on, you can go about and sort of take a better look at them, but these uh, lamps, they really think at least that they take their origin in, in the menorah, in the lamp that stood in the temple, right? They are actual candelabras, and we have a selection there. So basically, we have uh, both Shabbat lamps and Hanukkiyot. I decided to include the Shabbat lamps. They are they're standing on those both sides uh, of the shelves. So I, I decided to include them because they really do represent the idea of a menorah, of, a, of the temple lamp, as this kind of common image, right? So Shabbat lamps do not have uh, nine, uh, uh, nine places for, for the candle as the Hanukkah, right? They can have basically any number of lights. Shabbat lamps can, can have six lights, can have five lights, can have two lights, can have one light. It's, it's not about the number, right? It's about the fact that there is light. And basically, the two hanging ones, they're also Shabbat lamps. And they were hanging in the synagogues, right? And they were light. They were, they were, uh, they were lit for the uh, Shabbat services. So, so it's about light, right? Um, and the candelabra, and the, right, there is also kind of a certain difficulty here. But any time we will try to dig deeper into any of these, uh, into any of these images, we will, we will discover that the stories are, are not as simple, and the images are not as simple, and we do not know much. Very often, we do not know more than we know, right? So the menorah, right, the actual lamp that in this image here, uh, Bezalel, and this is, this is the architect, right, the, the artist of the, uh, of the tabernacle, Bezalel, who was uh, who was given this incredibly important task by Moses to actually uh, create the tabernacle where the tablets of the law will be housed, right? So after all, there was an artist there, right? We can't really go without them. So there was an artist there. And uh, the book of Exodus actually describes quite in detail how the tabernacle is supposed to look. And what are the different objects that Bezalel had to, uh, uh, had to fashion, as well as the tabernacle itself? And it actually describes the menorah, right? So given that, if we think about the uh, progression of the story in the, in the lithographs, uh, you will see that, in fact, Chagall makes the uh, menorah present way before it is actually present in the story. Because here, Bezalel, and if you look at his face, you will notice a slight resemblance to the features of Mark Chagall himself, right? So he had this idea that, yeah, well, I'm actually, you know, it would be nice to be Bezalel, right? That was his aspiration, maybe, right? So Bezalel or, or Mark Chagall here, right? This is the, the, uh, the place in the story where he is forging all those uh, all those uh, objects, right? But uh, as you can see, we have at least five other appearances of the menorah that, in terms of the stories, they don't make sense because it was only created here, right? It was only mentioned here. So one of the kind of most prominent images is, of course, uh, that image uh, in, the, in the corner where we can see Aaron, right? the first priest who is standing next to a menorah, right? That by, by, by the, uh, through, through the um, logic of the story, the menorah was not made yet, okay? But why is it there? Because the image, the idea 
of light, right, and of this lamp is more important than how the story goes. Images are very powerful, and who else but Marc Chagall really understood that, right? Images are at least as powerful as stories, right? And here he obviously stands his ground as not just a Jew, but an artist <laughs> Jew, right? Who, whether we want it or not, but is to some extent is always has to work against the second commandment, right? So here he clearly states, we need images, right? We need the image of the menorah and we need it even before, right? It was made in the story. So, so the menorah is important, right? And this, uh, this idea of light is important, but what about the actual object? So on the one hand, the book of Exodus describes it pretty much in detail, right? Uh, and you know, Chagall do doesn't really do sort of a very good uh, work in describing it the way the Bible presents it, but he doesn't have to. Um, so we do know how it looked like. We do know that it was made of pure gold. Uh, we do know that it had uh, seven, uh, so seven places for, uh, for the oil, so seven lamps. Um, and we do have a pretty decent description about the actual iconography of how it, it was supposed to look like uh, a blossom of an almond. So basically each head right, was supposed to be like a little flower. So basically if we look at the menorahs back there, especially at the, at the brass one that stands on three feet that look like fish, right? That is the one that is more or less makes a more precise job to some extent, right? At least it's how it creates the actual branches, right? So it's a little bit more floral, right? So, so the image is important, right? And the object is important. And we know that from, from, from the book of Exodus that the menorah was actually produced. And then Solomon builds the first temple. And then we are already in trouble. Because it is said that in the temple of Solomon there were 10 menorahs. Not one, 10. And why 10? Well, it was a really big building. You, you would need a lot of light. You, you, seriously, you will need a lot of light to lighten it, right? So, because, uh, because the rabbis don't like these kinds of contradictions, right? So they would explain it away and say, yes, there were 10, but there was also the one from, from the tabernacle. It stood in the middle, right? So five on one side, five on the other, the one from the tabernacle in the middle, right? Well, makes sense. Why not? Okay. But then things get even more complicated because from, uh, from different sources, but also from, from, the, um, uh, uh, from the stories of David, we know that David and different other personalities donated to the temple even more lamps. We know that there were even more lamps, well, probably in, in the attic or in, in the basement, wh wherever they were keep, uh, keeping the extra stuff, right? So in fact, there were, we don't really know how, ma how many, right? And then the first temple is destroyed and Jews are taken to Babylon and the Chaldeans, right? They were so nasty that when they entered the temple, they cut all the menorahs into pieces. So we know for sure that that thing, th those things are gone, right? They are lost. Although, although there is also a story that says, but the one, the one in the middle, or what we think that was in the middle, it was hidden. It was hidden and it reemerged in the second temple. So the one in the second temple that was built by Herod, right? So 586 before, uh, before our era, uh, I'm sorry, 
516, am I right? I, uh, yeah. Yeah, 586 was, was, the, was the destruction of the first one. 516 is, uh, is the erection of the second one. So in the middle, right, one menorah, and that's the menorah from the tabernacle, right? But then the second temple is destroyed by the Romans, right? And here an interesting thing happens because Almost the only actual representation of the menorah that we have is from a Roman relief that describes how all the different objects that were plundered by the Romans from the temple, they are carried in this uh, procession, right? And then, then we have an actual image of the menorah, right? And it actually has seven branches. It looks very much like what is described before. And here we, we go into a whole lot of trouble because there would be people who would say that the description in Exodus is a later one. That the description is ex of Exodus uh, in Exodus comes from much later time. And the description of Menorah in Exodus comes from much later time that was inserted in the book of Exodus. In order, so the, we're in trouble. Right? We're in trouble because, again, we don't know at least as much as what we know. Okay? But, again, it is not so much this that is important. The image is important, right? So, and properly speaking, the only historical image that we have of the menorah is that Roman uh, relief. But even there, there is trouble because the basis of the menorah there is octagonal. And it is quite sort of straight. Uh, no, no, the, the angles are not, are not straight if it's, it's, it's an octagon. But it's not the basis that is described in the Bible. Right? The Bible says that it's, it stood on something like lion. Uh, lion heads or lion legs, possibly. We don't really know how to, it, how to interpret it, right? But it definitely was not octagonal, right? So is it the menorah? Was it something else? But what we do know that this basis actually looks like many other Roman lamps. So. Does it mean that the person who was transporting those very expensive objects created a box to guard the feet, right? Does it mean that it's not the actual image of the menorah? Who knows, right? But is that so important? Well, kind of yes. But what is more important is the image, right? Because, I mean, fact, you see, that, 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 that there it is, right? There it is. So I'm sort of trying to head to this idea that many origin stories, right, that we have, and the story of Hanukkah, right, is definitely one of those origin stories. They are basically employing the idea of etiology, right? It is when you have to explain something in your current moment, right? But you have to give it a meaning, so to speak, backwards, right? There are a great deal of stories like that. They're origin stories, right? They are extremely powerful. And it is something that human beings do, not just Jews, right? Every nation, for sure, because to build a nation, oh my gosh, you need a handful of origin stories. Because if you actually look at history, most often there is hardly anything to get a good grip on. Right? Because it's messy, right? It's messy, it's dissipating, it's very, very difficult to get a proper story out of history, right? So you have to use your imagination, right? And the story of origins, right, of Hanukkah is most probably one such story, right? Um, and I'm getting to the kind of other part of our talk. And that part of our talk really has to do with uh, the very important 
uh, spiritual, religious, and political movement that came together in uh, Eastern Europe in the uh, 18th century, and it's called the Hasidism, right? The Hasids, the Hasidim, right? And why do they make an appearance here? Because Mark Chagall here comes from a little place, right? He was born in a little place near Vitebsk, and that place once was called Liadi, and now it is called Liozno. And in this place, more or less 100 years before the birth of Mark Chagall, there was another person. And that person is known as the founder of, and let's see if you, if you will get it. So, Chochma, Chet, Bina, Bet, and Dvekut, Daled, Chet, Bet, Daled, Chabad. So, the, uh, the rabbi who began the Chabad movement, that is very much alive and uh, 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 today, was indeed uh, Rabbi Schneerson, who was a rabbi of Liadi. And Mark Chagall was born into a milieu, into a Jewish milieu that was very deeply rooted in the ideas and practices of Hasidism. So, Hasidism, let us, let us be reminded, it's again a Jewish mystical uh, uh, religious movement, right? And the word itself, Hasidut, Hasid, right? Who is a Hasid? A Hasid is basically a pious person. And by the way, throughout the history of, uh, uh, of Jewish religion, there were different Hasidim not only the ones that we normally uh, uh, think about when we think about the, the movement of Hasidism, because Hasid is a pious person. So those specific pious people, right, uh, they were a very interesting bunch. And um, the founder of the Hasidic movement is um, Israel ben Eliezer, or as he's better known and uh, uh, at, at his name, Baal Shem Tov, or Besht, right? So Rabbi Baal Shem Tov, he was born at 17 sometimes at the very, very beginning of the uh, 18th century. We don't know exactly when. Uh, and a lot of very interesting things converged during that time. And it was, and, and the, the Hasidut, is a very complex phenomenon in a sense. And while very often when we think about the stories and the, and the, the kind of general uh, folkloristic appeal, right, of that movement, we might think about it as something that belongs to the past. But in fact, the movement was incredibly modern. It was, in a fact, we, we, can, we can say that it was a reaction <coughs> to modernity. And a reaction to modernity can go different ways, right? So within the Jewish culture, one way is the way that is represented here, the reform, right? It is to embrace modernity to some extent, right? But to acculturate and to even assimilate, right? Uh, the other way, right, is the way of reaction right, the way of conservatism, but it doesn't make it less modern, right? It's a truly modern phenomenon. So in those who reacted against, there were, let's say, two main groups, right? One of them were the Hasidim, the other one was the Mitnagdim, right? Those who basically opposed the Hasidim. So why, if they are all basically reactionaries, why is the disagreement, right? And this is an interesting thing. What the movement of the Hasidu did, in fact, was first of all to popularize and to simplify the Jewish mystical uh, learning, the Kabbalah. 
So before the uh, ways of the Hasidim were developed, the Kabbalah was to, to, to a great extent, uh, you, you had to be pretty privileged to be able to really partake in the wisdom, right? But it is the 18th century, so a very important innovation happens, right? And it influences very deeply, not just the Jewish world, but the world all over. It's called printing, right? Books are cheap, right? Books are cheap. Books are much more easily disseminated. And because of that, the sacred teaching, right? The teachings that very often were really the privilege of a very uh, limited circles, right? They become much more available. But the Hasidut goes much further. It actually implements different kinds of experiences, right? And basically, one of the things that probably were especially sort of uncomfortable with the uh, movement who opposed the Hasidim was the idea that to the Hasidim there was a spark, a divine spark in everyday life, in matter, in materiality, in joy, in drinking, in merriment, right? So um, they were, in that sense, a less severe version of Judaism. And here I all immediately have to contradict myself and to say that some, some of the Hasidim were incredibly austere and uh, actually took, uh, took that revelation of the divine spark, on the contrary, into mortification of the flesh rather than into the merriment. But interesting enough, right, in those dichotomies, there is very often a similar drive, right? So the idea that the body, the matter, it does have a divine spark, that everyday life has a divine spark. You just need to know how to awaken it, right? So in that sense, uh, very often, the Hasidic teaching, right, that was much more welcoming, right, that was more simple in a way, uh, and moreover included something that for, the, for its opponents was completely unacceptable. The figure of the tzaddik, right, Baal Shem Tov was the first major tzaddik, Right? And why the opponents were not happy about it? Because, well, first of all, just a hundred years before, there was um, a guy called Sabtai Tzvi. He was a false messiah, right, in Turkey. He claimed he is a messiah. So for proper, right, uh, classic Judaism, that's pure heresy, right? Any kind of claim of that sort is thoroughly heretic. And when the Hasids appear, right, the Hasidic tzaddik appears as that person who basically in one figure becomes the rabbi, uh, but he is also the judge, and he is also Baal Shem Tov. Baal Shem Tov basically means he is able to manipulate the sacred name, or play, putting it simply, he is a mage. Right? He can do wonders, right? He can do miracles. He's a magician. Aha! That did not sit well with uh, the classic idea of what Judaism is, right? That was too close to idolatry, right? And that definitely created an aura around a person, an aura that was not really appropriate in terms of, again, the classical uh, teaching of, of Judaism. But in terms of the general population, it was actually a really great idea. Because there was this person, right? And you could come to him and ask him to intervene with the divine, right? To ask him, I'm sick, right? I don't have money. I'm in trouble. Ask him to help me, because he was the channel, right? He has a channel, direct channel to, to God, right? 
So in that sense, the tzaddik is close to the Christian saint. And that, of course, was another issue that was deeply unacceptable in terms of uh, the people who opposed the Hasidic movement. So into all of that, that person is born. Okay? Into a teaching that is, first of all, very acceptable in terms of this idea that in everyday life, there is a divine spark. Okay? There is magic. There are miracles. Look at all those images. They are all miraculous, right? They are all based exactly on that kind of feeling that the world around us is magical, that there is a divine spark hidden in, in this chair, in this mic, in, in, every, in, every, in, in every one of us. So this is the world that, uh, or the world you, from which that person comes. Okay, and because uh, of this uh, possibility to make a religion acceptable, much more sort of accessible, right, to uh, to people who are less learned, right, or to people who are generally maybe not very keen on the really, really, really austere and strict way of life, right, that. Uh, uh, Judaism often, uh, often asks for, and also to people who are, whether we want it or not, but they live under Tsar, right? Because part of the Hasidic movement happens in what is in that time the Russian Empire. The other part happens in the, Austro uh, in the Austro Hungarian Empire, right? There is a Tsar. And Tzadiks, they also very often become like little Tsars, right? And this idea of that person with immense power, like with straight channel to God, it's an acceptable idea, right? For people who live in such society, it makes a lot of sense, right? Maybe sometimes it makes more sense than an abstract text, okay? So one of the ways in which the Hasidic teachers disseminated their study, their, uh, uh, their learning was through storytelling. The Hasidim were really great storytellers. And uh, if uh, you, you haven't done it before, then probably one of the easiest and sort of most uh, pleasurable ways into the uh, stories of the Hasidim is to read the books, the compilations that were put together by, Ma by Martin Buber, uh, and to, to get sort of a glimpse into, into, into that magical world. So there is a story, right? There is a story, and sometimes the story features Baal Shem Tov himself, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it happens in a forest, sometimes it happens uh, in, a, in, a, in an inn, sometimes in a, it involves drinking, sometimes it does not involve drinking. Depends, there are different versions. But the core of the story is that once there was a Jew, he was not super educated, and he could not remember his prayers by heart. The only thing that he could do when he had to pray is to open his Siddur, his prayer book, and only with the help of the prayer book he could, he, he could do the work. And it so happens that Yom Kippur is coming, and he is stuck. Again, different versions and where he is stuck. But the point is that he does not have an access to the synagogue, he doesn't have an access to his prayer book, Yom Kippur is coming, he has to pray, what to do? And this Jew does a simple thing. He says, God, I, I don't remember the prayer as well, but I do remember the alphabet. I will just say the alphabet and you put together the prayers, you know them, you know them, right? So he prays in this way, he just repeats and repeats the alphabet. And here again, depending on the version that we were talking about, but one version says that then he saw that the sky opened up and he saw the door to heaven. He saw the gate to heaven open. And he saw how 
the letters entered, entered the door, entered the gate, and he knew that his prayer was received. So, let me create a sort of interpretation of my own for that story, because there are obviously uh, uh, religious ones, but let me tell it simply. When we look at the images here, they are our prayers, right? Chagall doesn't always know the letters. Chagall doesn't always know the prayers as they're supposed to be, but he's an artist. He can create images. And it's, it's, it's interesting that when the Jew prays, what he sees up there, he sees an image, right? So while maybe he did not remember the prayers, but he surely knew what he was praying for, what he needed. Maybe he was ill. Maybe he wanted a successful marriage for his kids. Maybe he wanted a new house. Uh, who, who knows what he wanted, but he surely knew. And it is this image that he projected upwards with the letters. He knew, and God knew, and God responded in image, not in voice, not in text, in image. So very often, we don't know the prayers. Very often, life is so difficult, right? Or we don't know how to react. We don't even have the words, right? But these guys, they help us out. They pray for us in images. So this is what I had to say for today. And uh, probably the only other story that I wanted to add when I was kind of trying to somehow put together all of this in my mind and, and this uh, uh, sensation that really comes uh, over you often when you uh, dive deeper into, into the history of the Jewish people or into any kind of history at all, given that what happens today uh, is really so, so, so difficult. So, and we, we don't have words, right? We don't have words. We don't, very often, we don't even know how to put together our own emotions, right? And these people up there, they're, they're doing it for us, right? They choose to stay and to be a witness to what's happening now, okay? And uh, it's good that we have them. And I would just like to conclude with, with the words of a Jew who recently passed away, and uh, may God bless his soul. And you all know him. And uh, those who know him better feel that the world became quite emptier since he is gone. And his name is Leonard Cohen. So uh, in an album that he created in 2014, one of the later works that he created, there is a song. And in the song, there are several lines that it, they seem to me sort of speak to what we, what we were trying to accomplish today, right? How to be in the position when we don't know more than we know, but we still want to have a dignity, right? Uh, of, of people who acknowledge uh, that complicated and complex position that they are in, okay? So Leonard Cohen was a real champion in doing that and in doing that properly. So in that song, there are lines that say, the following. Though I had my heart frozen to keep away the rot, my father said, I'm chosen. My mother said, I'm not. I listened to their stories, the gypsies and the Jews. They were good. They were not boring. They were almost like the blues. Thank you. Right, and if, if there are any, any questions, then feel free. Yes, please.
morality to your children in a religious context. And there were Buddhists and you know many, many different religions. But I was really struck um, by the comments that were, were made by the Rabbi Sappho from Indianapolis, the blessed memory, um, husband and wife team. And they said, uh, and, and that's why it, it touches me, this, this presentation, but they said that the stories in the Torah were the way that we teach. And because they're simple stories. Mm -hmm. And if I add in the extension to the images, children don't know words, mm -hmm. obviously, um, especially when we begin teaching them and telling them these stories. But those stories were simple. They weren't complicated compli concepts like meditation or abstinence or, you know, morality is a very complicated concept in, in an adult mind. So um, if you wanted to speak to the child reflection. Um, right. Oh. Right. Well, I, you know, I, I sort of, it's, 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 it's a big, big issue uh, to, to, to rise. And, and I certainly will, will not be, you know, the, the person to, to speak about more morality. Um, child, well, I think that very often we make the comparison between artists and children. Uh, I would say that this comparison is wrong. Artists are not children. Artists are proper adults with extremely developed capabilities. Uh, and sometimes it is just that we, because we kind of, we ourselves remain in a very frozen kind of situation, then we, we think that when somebody else who is an adult, who does things differently, we sort of think, well, th they're like kids, right? So they're not like kids. He's not a child, right? He's a very adult person. It is just that his view, right, and his senses remained open, right? And maybe in that sense, we can speak about childhood as, as, the, as this place where we still don't know, right? We explore. We still don't have answers, right? So proper artists are always in that place, not in the, not in, in the sense that they remain children, but they remain open, right? And probably, you know, any kind of serious discussion that pertains to history and history of morality and all of that tangle that we are so deeply in, sort of probably we just need to remain open and explorative. And then maybe we can get out with something like an image. So I, I don't know if that makes sense. Well, his images were based on some of his, obviously, his growing up experience, as you said. Mm. And my recollection is that he was caught in some pogroms. Totally. That he had personal access to seeing family members mm. killed. Mm -hmm. That he created pictures of that in images mm -hmm. that then reflected his childhood image to what he was trying to say mm. as an adult after he thought about it and lived with it. Mm. Uh, certainly, uh, there is uh, the, the, there is obviously we we know a great deal about his early life from from his from his book that is called My Life, and that's basically the only source that we, we really have about about his early experiences, and he definitely describes uh, describes a pogrom. He describes a lot of humiliation. He describes a situation that uh, when during the uh, the pogrom. He happened to be on the street, and a man came to him and asked whether he is a Jew. He replied no, and he stayed alive. Uh, so um, thinking about the story of the Maccabees and uh, the, the, the whole sort of the, this whole situation around the, uh, 
the revolt also involves quite a few stories where people died on Kiddush Hashem, right, for, for the sanctification of the holy name. So basically they refused to, to betray their faith and then they were killed. So in that sense, Mark Chagall was not a Maccabee, right? He said, I'm not a Jew, and he, and he stayed alive. And thanks God he did that, because <laughs> otherwise, right, we would not have, have had that. Uh, so the experiences of childhood remain with us all the time, with any of us. We don't have to be artists, right, uh, to feel that. That's, that's just how we work. But how we live this life after post those experiences, right, and how we remain uh, in, in kind, some kind of correspondent with, with the world, that's what makes us adults, right? And for artists, proper artists, right, good artists, they remain open. And then all those things come, come through, right? And they come through differently. They are never the representation of what happened. There might be an echo, there might be an interpretation, there might be something that happened between there and now, but they are never the thing, right? Because we change, we grow up. And these guys are really grown up. Yes. So was this series prompted by his finances and his, his physical needs, or was it prompted by something in his soul uh, or his childhood? The story of Exodus? The, no, the creation of the lithographs of the story of Exodus. Uh, well, from what we know, Chagall was very deeply interested in the Bible and for, for good reasons, well, you know, many people were. Right? Well, it's, it's an interesting book after all, right? Good stories, right? Uh, and, uh, and he started working on, uh, on those images back in 1920s, and he kept working on them until uh, 1960s. Uh, so, and there is a much larger body of work, which is called uh, Drawings from the Bible, uh, and that's only, that's, that's only part of it. Right? <coughs> so it obviously was important to him. Right? To say beyond that, I probably we, we, sh we should ask him. But, but I think he has given us the answer. Right? Thank you. My pleasure. <laughs>